Good evening, friends. Thank you for logging on on the 25th of July for this next edition of our series celebrating the centenary of the Baha'i Faith in Australia. Tonight, I've asked John Walker to lead the session. And I've asked John to do this because I noticed that he's in every photo that's been taken of the Australian Baha'i community since the 1960s. You see, most every convention I've been at, every summer school I've been at, John has been one of the constant supporters of the community. And as you know, he served on the National Assembly. He's been an auxiliary board member. He's also active in his, in his profession in, in accountancy. And many years ago, when we were head an association for Baha'i Studies, John gave a wonderful presentation called Accounting for Peace. I haven't forgotten that wonderful presentation. And I've been looking forward for many years for an opportunity to, for John and Ferry to tell a bit of their story, their experience in the Baha'i community. And tonight to start to do that by looking at, at some of the photos of some of those early events that he may want to speak about, that he may want to extend from there into other memories and recollections. So John, welcome uh, tonight. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. I'll mute myself and I'll hand over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Graham. And uh, it's wonderful to see so many faces here tonight. Uh, most of the people that I, that I see before me, I know uh, or have met at some stage in my Baha'i life, uh, just a year there from Cap I saw. And, um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's quite an intimate uh, occasion because all of us are in this together. And, um, and uh, my wife is just coming in, um, in Fari. Now, uh, what I thought I would do, uh, Graham, first of all, asked me to, um, to tell you a little bit about how I actually became a Baha'i and what is my own background. And then we were going to have a look at some photographs uh, of, that were taken at, at Yerrimbul and at uh, Tulang Road, Paddington uh, in the early 60s. Um, and uh, see if we can sort of identify as many people as possible in those photographs and share some of our understandings and stories about those people we hear. Now, there are others in those photographs besides myself, uh, people like uh, David and uh, Sue Podger, uh, and Bruce Saunders, uh, my cousin, Hugh Walker, who I've tried to get on here tonight, but he, is not, uh, he hasn't used Zoom before, and I think he's having a little bit of difficulty getting on. Um, but uh, we may be able to get him a bit later. Uh, and, uh, and also John Davidson and Elizabeth Heinsen. And I've spoken to all of, or, or I've emailed all of them and sent them the photographs so that they also can uh, give us some of their recollections as well of the people that are in those photographs. So, so we're all in this together and uh, we're all going to sort of share in this experience tonight. Now, um, starting, the, the, one of the photographs that we're going to be sharing, I'm just going to now go to share my screen. Share screen, All right, share. Uh, and okay, can you see that photograph? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, this is a photograph taken at the Baha'i Summer School. And you know, we don't know the exact year, and we've tried to figure it out, but we think it's probably either 1961 or 1962. And we're going to come back to this photograph, and there are quite a, a few very interesting people in this photograph. Um, now, Graham mentioned earlier that uh, I'm in all these uh, different photographs that he's seen over the years, but you can see me there in the back, right in the middle. My place in photographs is always at the back. Um, 
I'm so tall. And if I stand in the front, I, I block everybody out. So I always go to the back. That's where you'll find me in photographs. So we'll, we'll come back to this photograph. Anyway, how do I get out of this? John, who's the Persian looking chap to the right? Uh, we'll, we'll come to that. I, I know who that is, uh, but we'll, we're going to have a look at this photograph in some detail later. Um, you are screen share. You can use arrows to move your pictures if you want. I want to get back to the main screen. Okay. Back arrow. I'm just going to do stop share. Okay. Now, it's better when I can uh, see everybody. I feel as if I'm more in contact with everybody than when I can't, can't see you. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is just tell you a little bit, bit about why I'm in that photograph. Uh, and, uh, and how it just happens to be that uh, I was at the Yerrindal Summer School in 1962. Well, first of all, uh, I, my father was a Baha'i, yeah, and um, he became a Baha'i through a chain of circumstances. This chain began with my uncle. Uh, Uncle Noel, and he is also in some of the photographs we're going to show you. He became a Baha'i, uh, according to Hugh, my cousin, in about 1939. And he was a, a bank officer. He worked for the commercial banking company of Sydney in Martin Place in Sydney. And the, um, the Boltons, Stanley and Mariette Bolton, had a chiropractic practice at that time in Martin Place as well. So he uh, went to them for chiropractic treatment and lo and behold, uh, what did he hear about when he went and saw the, the Boltons? He heard about the Baha'i faith. And of course, Mariette was a very vigorous uh, and enthusiastic teacher of the faith. And he was the one, she was the one who actually introduced him to the, to the faith. And he, he read, um, he, he read the, only one book before he decided to become a Baha'i. This book was The Heart of the Gospel by George Townsend. John, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Is that you? It's me. That's right. Fantastic. Great. Finally made it. I've worked it out. That Dad heard of the faith just before Christmas 1940. Aha, uh -huh, right. Okay. Okay, well, that's, that sets the sort of uh, the time frame. Now, um, when he became a Baha'i, he um, created great commotion uh, in the family. Because our family, uh, or my, my father's side of the family, my, my grandfather was actually a minister in the Church of England. And uh, you can imagine, uh, and not only that, he had been a missionary in India. He was, he was of Irish background. He was, he was born in a place um, uh, in, in Ireland and uh, he, um, he went to India as a missionary. And um, so he, you know, he was a very sort of um, ardent and uh, uh, devoted teacher of Christianity. Uh, and of course, when his son, his eldest son, who was also born in India, Noel was born in India, uh, when he became a Baha'i, uh, this caused great commotion in the family. I thought I might show you. Um, uh, I might show you. Um, a Okay, this is my grandfather. Okay. Also, um, uh, uh, 
excuse uh, gunpowder as well. And uh, he was uh, he, he was a wonderful man. He had a fantastic uh, he was a fantastic speaker. He had a beautiful Irish brogue, um, and uh, he was highly respected uh, in the Church of England in Sydney. Uh, this is his marriage in India. His marriage took place in Coimbatore, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, and uh, there's there's my grandmother there with him in the middle, and he also had a twin brother who was sitting just on the ground in front uh, near the bouquet. That's his twin brother. And uh, they, uh, he came to Australia in order to recover from some sort of tropical illness. And that's where he met his future wife. And she, uh, she and her family had uh, relatives in India. And it was decided that she would actually travel to India and they would get married in Coimbatore in India. They subsequently came to live in Australia and uh, they had a, a large family. Uh, Hugh, you may be able to correct me on this, but I think about 11 or 12 children. Um, well, Ed, Edward Walker had 10 children. 10 children, okay. So yep. you can imagine how many relatives I've got. Um, so uh, now, now after, and also, that's a picture of him. And this is the, he was the rector at uh, All Saints Church Parramatta when I knew him during the years that I sort of knew him as my grandfather. Uh, this church was built um, in the time of Samuel Marsden, uh, by the way. Now, this is a picture of the interior of the church. And here's the list of the ministers of the church. You can see there Edward Walker, JP, 1941, 1956. I was John, born... you're not you're not sharing yet. If you wanted to share that with us, oh right, okay. Uh, yeah. Is that it? Can you see it now? Ah uh, yes, yes we can. Okay, well you can see there. I'll just go back then to. That was my grandfather. Did you see that? And then that's the All Saints Church in Parramatta. And that's the interior. And there's the, in the uh, list of the uh, uh, rectors of the church. And you can see my grandfather, Edward Walker, JP, 1941 to 56. Uh, and I was born in 1943. So I, for all of my sort of all of the time that he was there, that was really the only parish that I knew him to be uh, the rector of. Now, uh, now when uh, when my uh, just a, perhaps a little bit about my my other side of my family, my mother. Uh, was uh, born in Wilcannia in Western New South Wales in a tent. And um, she, her father, this is her father here. Uh, his name was Robert Leckie. And this is her mother, Selina Leckie. And uh, they owned about 100,000 acres uh, near between Wilcannia and uh, White Cliffs. And uh, they, they ran sheep at that time. And um, my father met my mother in Cobar when he was a bank officer in that area and uh, they subsequently got married. Uh, now, this is an interesting photograph. This shows, uh, yeah. this is a picture of uh, my uncle, Noel in the, in, in the white shirt and Hugh, who has just uh, come on, is the tall person on the left. And Ian is the tall person on the right, and my father is next to him, and with my auntie Bessie, who is Noel's wife, and Hugh and, uh, and Ian's mother sitting down there. Now, th this picture is quite interesting because my father was uh, about to depart Australia uh, on ship to the Solomon Islands, where he pioneered uh, around about 1963. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of the whole family. Now, when Noel became a Baha'i, this created a big 
a problem in the family. Um, and uh, my father at that time was not living in Sydney, but he was living uh, somewhere in the, in the country. And he came down to Sydney for a holiday. And when he came to the city, uh, grandfather said to him, look, uh, you know, your, your brother's uh, left the true faith. He's got mixed up with this uh, Islamic sect. And, uh, you know, I, I've talked to him, it doesn't make any sense. And he said, I'm deputizing you to go and talk to him and bring him back to the true path. So my father um, went to Noel's house, which was in Roseville at that time. And uh, he walked up the driveway uh, to uh, sort of, but he could hear the lawnmower going out the back. So he, he walked up the driveway, talked to Noel, and, uh, and Noel was sort of there mowing the lawn and dad was so fired up by granddad that uh, he said to him, look, he said, uh, you know, I've come here, you know, what have you done? You've, you've disunited the whole family, you, you've created disruption, you've uh, turned away from the true faith, you've got mixed up with this Islamic sect and, you know, what, what are you doing? And Noel, Noel said to him, well, he said, look, he said, I'm not going to talk to you until I finish mowing the lawn. And uh, then he said, he said, you, you can't discuss anything until you know something about it. He said, look, over there on the, on the garden, uh, there's, a, there's a chair there in the garden. On that chair, there's a book, which I've been reading. Sit down, have a read of that. And then I, after I finish mowing the lawn, we'll have a chat. So um, my father told me, I'll just get the book now. This is the book. The High World Faith. And my father said that he sort of took the book and he opened the book up and in the, the very sort of first page there, it says, the prophetic cycle hath verily ended, the eternal truth is now come. And uh, my father told me that when he read that, he instantly knew it was the truth. Amazing, isn't it? And uh, while he didn't become a Baha'i, he, and then he started reading through other passages in the book, and he, and he said, look, I read everything in, you know, in half an hour or so, and he said, everything I agreed with. So um, it was, he found himself in a, in a difficult position. Uh, he couldn't carry out the mission that was uh, given to him by grandfather, because he sort of more or less instantly recognized the truth of the Baha'i revelation. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, sort of that was it. And uh, uh, he, he never actually became a Baha'i for some time after that, uh, because my mother, when he mentioned it to my mother, he, um, he found that she was um, extremely resistant to the idea. She, she, you know, she used to say to me, look, uh, you know, your father's got mixed up in that Baha'i Shindi. Um, and, um, uh, and uh, you, know, you, you'll, you know, we'll never be accepted by people. It'll be, uh, you know, we'll be ostracized in society um, and so forth and so on. And uh, she, she was adamant that she was not going to have anything to do with the Baha'i faith or, or, or anything to do with it. And in fact, she didn't even want to have any relationship from that point onwards with Noel and Bessie um, because of uh, the fact that they had introduced uh, the faith to my father. And because of this resistance, my father didn't become a Baha'i for quite some time after that. And I'm not exactly sure what year it was that he became a Baha'i because he never discussed it in the, in the family and he never um, it, it was, he never talked to me or to my sister about it. And so, you know, it was sort of like a, a subject that was never discussed. I just, uh, just wanted to show you another picture. This is a picture of my father and my mother and my sister and myself. Uh, this is really the only picture I've got of the four of us all together. Uh, and, um, and it was clear that, uh, that my mother and father 
were not able to be united on this question of religion and gradually they drifted apart. And eventually they separated and my father decided uh, after the separation, which took place around about, I think around about 1959 or 58, um, I continued to live with, well, my sister and I continued to live with my mother, but my father decided to pioneer to Mudgee in New South Wales. And this is a picture of my father in Mudgee with the Stevensons. Uh, now, the, the person on the right, I'm not 100% sure who that person is. Somebody John, is your pictures. Who? You don't have your pictures on the screen. You have your, your, your image. I'm sharing your screen sharing, it says. We can uh, see your pictures, John. Yes, I John, can. we can see your pictures. It's the other person that can't see them. We can see, maybe I'm at your late, so it's not coming to your screen yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe. I can see him. Okay, yeah. I'll wait. And uh, John, we can see the photos. Please proceed. Graham, can you see the photo? Yes, we can see the photo, so please proceed. And just, if you can, try to come a little closer to your microphone, if you can. Okay. Thank you. That's as close as I can get. That's good. And the story's going just great, John. Keep going. I'm just worried about the people who can't see the pictures. Is there a reason? Sorry, no, it must, might have been delayed. Uh-huh. Okay, anyway, this picture is, is taken in Mudgee. Um, and my father... Uh, uh, was the first Baha'i in Maji, but um, soon after he um, arrived there, he, he came in contact with Joy Stevenson. Now, Joy was not a Baha'i at that time. Um, she had heard about the faith from Jim Heggie uh, previously when she went to see him for chiropractic treatment, um, but she didn't really know much about the faith. But uh, she I don't know how my father and Joy actually met up, but actually, you know, the forces of the universe uh, brought them together in some way. And, uh, and my father used to visit the Stevensons practically every day. Uh, and they used to have teachings and firesides and all the time. And eventually, um, Joy decided to become a Baha'i. And um, she and I actually became Baha'is much, at much the same time. Uh, I recall an interesting story when uh, when John John was not a Baha'i at that time, uh, but you know he was looking into it and uh, he was he was a surveyor. And he used to have a big team of surveyors, and one day he um, he decided he was going to become a Baha'i. And but after uh, work every day, he used to take his team to the pub. You know, one day he was at the pub and uh, and. Uh, he, he ordered a, a, a lemon squash. And this was so out of character for him in relation to all of his uh, team that they started to rib him about this. They say, oh, what are you doing? What, what, what are you drinking lemon squash for? And he said, oh, he said, uh, I changed my religion. I said, oh, come on. You, know, you changed your religion? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, I changed my religion. And... Um, Anyway, next day he comes along and takes him to the pub again. He orders lemon squash. I say to him, look, you know, you know what, what's going on here, you know? And he said, yeah, no, he said, seriously, he said, change your religion. And uh, this went on for about a week. And eventually they, they said, well, what bloody religion did you change to? <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, he had the opportunity to tell them that he'd become a Baha'i. So, um, so that was an interesting story, I thought. Now, coming back to <clears throat> okay, my, my eventually my father um, many some years previously, my father had actually. See the picture? Okay, some years previous, my father had, had met Alvin Blum. Alvin Blum was um, uh, a very charismatic sort of character. 
Um, he and his wife Gertrude were the knights of the whole art of the Solomon Islands. But at that time, when my father met them, uh, he was a, a member of the National Assembly yes. of the Highs of Australia and New Zealand. And, um, and Alvin, uh, my father had spoken to Alvin and told him, look, I'm having problems with my marriage and so forth. And Alvin had said, well, look, you know, if it doesn't work out, why don't you come and help us in the Solomon Islands? So Dad always had this thought in mind that eventually he would like to pioneer to the Solomon Islands. So when, when the marriage broke up, he decided that he would try to work out how he could do that. And so this photograph is of the, um, the uh, local spiritual assembly of Honiara, taken in 1965. And it shows you the members of that local assembly. Um, and they are Matthew uh, Nehemiah, Edmund Nehemiah-Marka, Johnson Eli Sukulu, Hamlin Walker, uh, that's my father, and Alvin Blum next to him. And the bottom uh, row is Johnson Ptolemy, Bill Lane, and Gertrude Blum. So that was his lifelong dream to be a pioneer and to emulate the, those pioneers who had gone in 1953 for the beginning of the 10 year war crusade. But he couldn't do it at that time because of the family situation. Okay. Um, this is another photograph that we'll come to. Um, yes, I am. Yes. But before we do that, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about um, how I decided to become a Baha'i. Um, now, all of us have, uh, you know, sort of different stories, and we often, and I often wonder why it is that I'm a Baha'i. I mean, what is the reason for that? I mean, to what extent is that due to uh, your family situation, to the upbringing? Uh, to what extent is it due to um, your own spirit of investigation? To what extent is it due to uh, other people's influence upon you? It, it, all of these factors are, you know, are, are difficult to evaluate. And I still can't say that I really know the answer to this question. But I thought I'd start out by telling you a, a, what I see is quite a, a fascinating and interesting story. Um, I'm going to flip through a few photographs here just to, to get to this story. Okay. Now, some years ago, um, I was in the building and construction industry and my partner was a Baha'i, Hamid Magzoub. Now, Hamid and I, uh, at that time also, I was uh, serving uh, in the National Spiritual Assembly. Um, at that time, we were wanting to build a Baha'i Center in Canberra. And um, Hamid uh, volunteered to build the center, um, basically at cost. Um, but as we had a company, we had to sort of work it all out together. So Hamid and I went to Canberra in order to get all the building permits and uh, registrations necessary to build a Baha'i Centre in Canberra. Now, I was born in Yass, uh, which is only a short distance from Canberra, about half an hour's drive. And, and I said to, yeah, and we'd done all of our work and it was a sort of a Saturday afternoon and we didn't have much to do. So I said to him, mean, why don't we drive over to Canberra and just have a look at, uh, uh, you know, see if I can, I can do resurrect some memories. So we, we did, we drove over to Canberra and in the car on the way over, um, I said to Hamid, look, um, there was a, I used to go to a, a, a Church of England Sunday school here in, in Yass when I was a kid, but before I went to school, so I must have been about four years of age at the time. Yeah, because I, I started school when I, when I turned five um, and my birthday is on the 2nd of January. So uh, I, I must have been about four 
And I, going to the Sunday school was a very vivid memory for me. And, um, and uh, I, I couldn't sort of figure out exactly why it had such strong memories. But anyway, um, I said to Hamid when we got to Yas, I said, uh, and, and I, I said to him, look, when um, at that Sunday school, I can re vividly re remember a picture that was in the Sunday school of Jesus surrounded by children, all of different races. And uh, anyway, that was the end of the discussion. When we got to, to Yas, uh, uh, we went around, we looked at the house I lived in the school I went to, and then we went to the, we found the church and we went to the church and the church had a big hall in front of it that wasn't obviously there at the time, wasn't there at the time that I was a child. And um, I said to, um, the, the hall was open and there were plenty of people milling around and, and there were wedding cars in the, in the driveway of the church. So there was a wedding just about to happen. And they were going to have the reception in the hallway in the hall. So we, we, you know, we went up to the people there and we said, look, um, you know, I, when I was a child, I, I used to attend a kindergarten here. And they said, yes, uh, that kindergarten is still here. And it's that building on the corner of this building. Uh, and, uh, and I said, oh, that's interesting. And they said, yeah, and see that uh, big slab of concrete there that's a different color to the rest? That, that was a sand pit. And I said, yeah, that's right. There was a sand pit there. And um, then I said, uh, is it possible to go inside the kindergarten? And they said, oh, no, look, we're having this wedding. We're all set up for the reception. You know, we're too busy. And then a lady at the back said, oh, look, uh, actually, I think the kindergarten teacher is here in the yard, in the, in the grounds of the church. So she says, look, I'll go and see if I can find her. So anyway, this kindergarten teacher, uh, this little old lady appears and approaches us. And uh, she says to me, she said, oh, how are you? And she said, did you attend my kindergarten? I said, well, I attended this kindergarten. She said, well, she said, I must have taught you. I said, well, how is that possible? I said, I'm you know, now six foot tall and then I was only short. How would you recognize me? She said, well, she said, I'm the only teacher this kindergarten has ever had. And uh, so I said, so she said, I must have taught you. And, you know, this was amazing. I couldn't remember her personally, believe it or not. And um, so anyway, she takes out a, uh, she's got a, a chain with about 50 keys on the bottom of it. And she takes one of the keys and she unlocks the kindergarten. And we go inside and it, I tell you what it was like, um, you know, going back in time to something that was so clear and present as if you know you just step from one time into another time everything was exactly the same as when I was a child anyway I started looking around this in the garden with all the little chairs and tables and everything and I couldn't see this picture and I said to her look uh, uh, can you do you have a picture here of Jesus surrounded by children all of different races she said oh yes she said I've still got it she said, it's in the cupboard, and she goes to this cupboard, opens, unlocks it, and she throws on the ground a whole lot of rolled up cheesecloth pictures. So she said, come on, let's, let's look, let's find it. So we're all down on the floor unrolling these cheesecloth pictures, and anyway, believe it or not, this picture emerges. This is the picture. Unfortunately, I had a camera with me. And... Uh, <coughs> So uh, I took a picture of it and she stuck it uh, with pins uh, on, a, on an easel, which was, uh, there you can see the easel there. And uh, there were thousands of thumbtack holes in the corners of the easel. So these were her sort of visual aids for teaching about religion. And, uh, you know, uh, I was astounded by this. And Hamid, who was standing next to me, could have sort of knocked him over with a feather because I told him about this picture on the way to Canberra. So there was evidence that I had remembered this picture. Now, why had I remembered this picture? I, did, I really don't know exactly why. But I think, you know, on, on reflection, I think that maybe one of the reasons why I remembered it was because of 
the teaching, the, the fundamental principle that was being taught, it sort of must, in, in some way, it must have appealed to my uh, consciousness at that time as a child. And certainly I had no experience at that time of people of different races and, and uh, religions and so forth. I mean, I was brought up in a, in a strictly um, Anglican uh, environment. And, uh, you know, there was no, the only contact I had with people of different races basically was with the Chinese gardener down the road and uh, the Aborigines who my mother was not very happy about. Um, so, so that, that, that was a, I, I feel that this woman, and her name, by the way, was Mary Pearl. And she told me that um, she, uh, that she had got married uh, during the war, uh, the Second World War, and that her husband had gone to England and became a fighter pilot and he was shot down in the Battle of Britain. And she decided that she would never marry again. She had no children of her own. And she decided that she would dedicate, uh, dedicate her life to teaching children. And, and uh, I was one of them. So, what influence did she have on me becoming a Baha'i? Who knows? One doesn't know, that's right. And uh, then you think about all of our children's class teachers over the, over the years in you know, teaching the Rui books and also teaching in state schools and all of the children's class teachers in the Baha'i community over the last 50, 60 years. What influence have they had on children uh, over that time? Also, during my, my youth, I was uh, in adolescence, I was a keen bushwalker go bushwalking and, uh, and I was a fairly sort of free spirit um, and uh, we had no mobile phones and emails of course in those days and when you, when you went bushwalking you went in the middle of nowhere and your mother and father didn't have a clue where you were. Uh, life was very different in those days to what it is today I can assure you uh, as far as uh, freedom is concerned. Uh, there's, there's me in that top picture there looking over the cliff into the Bungania Gorge uh, in the uh, uh, Shoalhaven uh, area. Now, when my father became a Baha'i, he never used to discuss the faith within our household. Uh, and the reason for that was because my mother was so opposed. And if he even mentioned it, she would get extremely angry. Um, but I knew he was a Baha'i. That, was, that, that I did know. And I remember one occasion uh, when I was uh, in my teens, and he told me that the guardian of the Baha'i faith had died. And this was in 1957. And uh, he was quite shocked by that. I, I remember he was quite shocked by it. And, um, uh, and, he, so that, and, and he mentioned it to me. Um, as far as knowing what the Baha'i faith was about, he never discussed it at all. Um, and uh, however, when, uh, when we came to live in Sydney, you know, my mother and father had separate bedrooms and he had a cupboard in his bedroom and in that bedroom he had some books. And um, so I was a curious sort of character and I used to go into this cupboard and I found a couple of books I, and I decided that, that I would find out what this Baha'i faith was about that was, that was causing so much trouble between my mother and my father. And uh, so I read, the first book I ever read was uh, called The Old Churches and the New World Faith. This was uh, actually more or less a pamphlet actually written by George Townsend. And having had a sort of a fairly sort of strong Christian upbringing uh, as I went to boarding schools um, from the age of 10 uh, through to 15, um, which were church schools, um, then, uh, you know, I sort of uh, resonated really with uh, the statement by George Townsend in, uh, in, that, in that pamphlet, which was a letter written to the clergy uh, of the Anglican church. 
Uh, it's really worth a read. It's, it's a fantastic uh, pamphlet. Um, and then after that, uh, I managed to get my hands on the whole art and the new era. And I read through that when I was about 13 or 14. And uh, I thought to myself, after reading that, I thought, well, all this makes sense. What is, what is the reason why my mother is so opposed to this? How is this possible that anybody could really be opposed to it? And um, but I tried to discuss it with her and said, look, you know, I, I, um, but, you know, she would have no, she would just not even discuss it. There was just no possibility of uh, any discussion whatsoever. Uh, so that basically that was it. And then uh, I finished uh, school in, um, in 1959 uh, and I was waiting for my results to see whether I got into university. And uh, my father came to Sydney and he said, um, you know, the, the idea was that I was going to go and spend a, a few weeks with him while I was waiting to get the results. And um, so we got out into the car outside the house in Ashfield. And, um, uh, and when we got in the car, Dad said to me, look, I'm, I would like to go to the Baha'i Summer School, uh, but uh, how would you like to go? And then I said to him, well, I said, Mum wouldn't like that. And uh, he said, well, let's not tell her. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how we started off, a little bit of deception. Um, anyway, uh, I said, yes, look, I'd love to go to the Baha'i Summer School. So we went to the Baha'i Summer School, and at the Summer School, I, I had the opportunity to really meet the Baha'i people from the Baha'i community for the first time. I'd never met any other Baha'is except my uncle um, and my cousins, of course, at that time. That was, they were the only other Baha'is that I had actually met. So, the first thing that really struck me at that time was how loving and united everybody was. And this was quite a contrast to other social experiences I had had up to then. And, I, and I, so I knew immediately, you know, that there was a truth here that was bringing all these people together in, in a high degree of love and unity. Um, also, the, the, there were various sessions uh, during the day, you know, lectures and so forth. One of the things that uh, really uh, uh, attracted me was, uh, was Frank Khan. Frank Khan would give a daily session on the Quran. And he would, um, he would come in and he would recite the Quran in Arabic. Excuse then, me, John. Yes. John, can you put that Yerimbul photo back? Because you're talking about Frank Khan, you can show him. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, so this is Frank Khan here. Can you... Frank Khan is uh, in this photograph just beside the door of the entrance to the Hyde Down Hall at Yerenville. Can you see that? And his wife, Debbie, Bibi, is just, uh, just below him. And Frank would, uh, he would uh, give us these lessons on the Quran, and, uh, and I was. Um, very interested in the Quran. Uh, I'll tell you about another experience I had earlier at school. Um, when, I, when I read the whole on the New Era, I realized that, um, that if I was to be interested in the Baha'i faith, I had to accept Muhammad as a prophet. And this was really a big barrier for me, given the sort of history that one was, was taught in those days about Islam. You know that Muhammad had 40 wives and he spread his religion by the sword and you know there was just nothing to commend him whatsoever uh, and, that, and that the Quran was sort of just like, like a delusion and um, one day at school uh, this was a Trinity Grammar School in Summer Hill uh, the, the minister came into the class and he said this was that we used to have what are called divinity classes and um, at that time I was a bit of an upstart and not as not, not as wise as I should have been, not that I'm that wise today, but anyway, in those days I was a lot less wise than I am now. And, and uh, the minister comes into the classroom and he said, 
Today we're going to talk about Islam. And I thought to myself, oh, this, this will be interesting. And then he said, now he said, the very first thing you have to know about Islam, he said, is that the Muslims are pagans. I said, I put my hand up and I said, sir, what is a pagan? He said, a pagan is somebody who doesn't believe in God. I said, sir, that's an atheist. He said, well, 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 well he said they're, they're heathens then. <laughs> Sir, what is a heathen? He said, a heathen is somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. I said, uh, sir, uh, look, uh, I've been reading a bit about Islam, and I, I heard that Jesus uh, in the Quran is uh, referred to as the Spirit of God, and that he's the, the virgin, the son, the virgin, the son of the Virgin Mary, and that he, uh, that his word is the word of God. I said, the Muslims seem to believe in Jesus uh, in some, um, they have some understanding of the, the nature of Jesus. He said, well, he said they don't believe he's the third person of the Trinity then. I said, look, um, I've got an uncle um, who lives in Hobart and, um, or in Tasmania, and he, I've had some discussions with him, and he is a minister, and he says, that he thinks that the concept of the Trinity is a type of allegorical story. Then he said to me, well, he said, look, it's not. And he said, I'll talk to you about it later. So anyway, later came, and then he said to me, he took me outside, you know, we were in the quadrangle, and he said, well, he said to me, look, he said, Walker, he used to call me Walker. He said, Walker, he said, uh, don't you ever do that again. He said, or oh, you won't be in the athletics team. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I was his top high jumper, so I knew it was a, 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 a bluff. <laughs> but um, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I I agree that I should not have been like that. But anyway, but it really got under my skin, and uh, and so that was a, a sort of environment in which you know we were thinking about religion, or at least I was thinking about religion in those days. So anyway, we're coming back to the summer school. Um, the, the summer school was not this one, by the way. It was a, this one was probably in 1962. The one I went to was in 1960. And, um, uh, and at that summer school, Peter Kahn was there as well. And he gave a talk uh, on the Book of Certitude. And the Book of Certitude, um, I'd never even heard of it. I may have read about it somewhere, but I, I, I didn't have any recollection of it. And he gave a series of six lectures, an hour every morning, on the Book of Certitude. And um, I was really impressed by his lectures and thought, well, like, I, I really should read this book. Um, and uh, so anyway, after the summer school, uh, I went home to... I went to Mudgee with my father. My, Mudgee, my father at that time was living in a boarding house. And so I had a room, a, a bed in the same room as him. And, uh, and I asked him if he had a copy of the Book of Certitude. And, uh, and he did. So I decided, I mean, he was working. I decided that I would read the Book of Certitude. So I started to read it and I read, I read it in that two week period I was there, I read it about seven times. I started to underline various passages in the Book of Certitude that appealed to me. In the end, I had the whole book basically underlined. It was, uh, it had, and, and I would say that it was a, I had a spiritual experience as a result of that sort of intensive reading of the Book of Certitude. You know how in Christianity they talk about a person being born again? Well, I would say that that's the sort of experience I had as a result of my intense study of the Book of Certitude. And I decided that I would, um, as a result of that, I would become a Baha'i. So anyway, I, I went back to Sydney. I took the train to Sydney. And um, when I got to Sydney, and I, I, I went to a house in Ashfield, and I knocked on the door. And when my, my mother opened the door, the very first thing she said to me was, You've become a Baha'i, haven't you? <laughs> and, uh, and I, I said to her, you know, I, 
very surprised by that question. Uh, she sort of took me off guard a bit, and I said to her, look, um, I haven't become a Baha'i, but I'm thinking about it. And uh, so then she really got angry with me. And, you know, and she said to me, look, she said, if you get yourself mixed up in this Baha'i business, she said, uh, you know, that, you know, I will disinherit you. And uh, at that time, uh, I mean, she, my father didn't have any money at all. And my mother had uh, an income from this property that she had inherited, had inherited along with all of the other children of which there were 13. So, but she still had a reasonable income on that property. And she paid for all of the private schools and everything that I went to. Um, so, you know, this was, uh, this was the sort of threat that was made, that if I became a Baha'i, she would disinherit me. And, uh, now, shortly after that, I got uh, my results for entrance into the University of New South Wales to study engineering. But the problem I now had was that she was not going to provide any funds to enable that to happen. In those days, there were university fees and uh, books and, you know, they didn't have free university and they didn't have tax schemes and all the rest of it. And so I had no money whatsoever. Um, and she was not going to pay. So oh, I got a job as an apprentice fitter and turner with email. Uh, and it just turned out that there was another Baha'i who had a person who had become a Baha'i around about that time. And his name was David Hassel. <laughs> David Hassel uh, also worked for email in Orange. And, uh, so we had a little bit of contact, not much, but uh, there was a little bit of contact. Anyway, I, I carried out this apprenticeship and I went to university at night. And, um, but I, in the end, I just could not deal with the situation with no money. I mean, the apprentice's wage at that time was about eight pounds a week and I had to pay for everything out of that. And, um, it was really, really difficult. And also I had no time because every night I had to do uh, attend lectures or studies or whatever. Uh, and, uh, and it was really, really difficult. So um, I, I ditched that after about four years and decided to go and get a job where I could make some decent money and then go back and finish that engineering degree full time. But I never got around to doing that. Uh, so, uh, I, while I was at the University of New South Wales, I met um, uh, Bruce Saunders. And uh, Bruce and I, uh, Bruce and I, Bruce had come from Adelaide and he was working for a company called Nationwide Foods. He was a chef. And he was, uh, he and I uh, sort of met up and we decided that we'd share costs and we got a one bedroom. Uh, bed sitter at, uh, in Coogee, and we rented that together. And uh, at that time, Coogee was part of the Randwick community. And Randwick had no local spiritual assembly at that time. This was in the 1960, early 60s, 61, 62. Uh, and, uh, but we had a group at that time. And uh, we had a group of eight, and I think I mentioned this at one of the previous sessions. We had a group of eight, uh, include, but plus me. But I, I wasn't yet 21, so I couldn't become a member of the assembly. But I was the secretary of the Randwick Baha'i group. So we came together one night in 1962. I think David Podger was there. And he was representing the regional teaching committee. And uh, we came together and we decided that we would form the assembly. But we had one contact. His name was Barry O'Brien. We invited him to come along and help us form the assembly. And we told him, look, we're having a meeting at seven o'clock or whatever the time was, and you know, please be there to help us form this assembly. He wasn't even a Baha'i at that time. So we, we went to the meeting at May Beats House in Randwick at uh, the appointed hour. We all got together, we said prayers. And at about eight o'clock, there's a knock on the door and Barry turns up with a huge smile and says, are you waiting for me? <laughs> and uh, so he turns up and uh, decides to declare and, and 
and they, they formed the local assembly of Randwick uh, in 1962 uh, by joint declaration. Uh, I'll never forget it. Never forget Barry O'Brien's smile. <laughs> um, okay, so that basically is sort of my story of uh, how I became a Baha'i. Uh, now let's have a look at some of the other Baha'is that were around at that time. Keep in mind, at that time, the Baha'i community was relatively small. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, this photograph here, uh, Hugh, my, my cousin, seems to think that this is not a convention photograph. But I don't know what it is if it's not a convention photograph. I think you might be right. Does anybody know what the occasion was? I cannot remember what the occasion was. But um, because all of the sort of people who you would expect to be at a convention were there. Uh, and all of the people who were elected to the NSA at that time are also in the picture. So if it's not a convention, I don't know what it is. Uh, I think it's a convention. Uh -huh. David Podger is there, bottom left yeah. corner. I'm just saying, uh, I was there. <laughs> it was a convention. You know the year? Oh, dear. Uh, well, if you look down on the bottom left, you can see my little baby, Sharon. Now, um, yeah, look at Sharon. That's right. Um, because, let's see, she was born in... 60. 1960. I think what? So she was what, two years old there or three years old? I don't know. Maybe certainly at that young age. Now, the other point is that Meg had not passed away. Uh, I don't think in that picture. I know she's in this picture. Now, where is she? I'm just trying to locate her. Of course, she's here somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, you're trying to just place it in time, so I think you, you're you pretty right. 62 or 63? Yeah. I believe it's 63. Okay. Right, okay. Well, let's say this is 1963. Um, <clears throat> so this picture here is... Um, this, this has been after the World Congress. This picture is taken at Two Lane Road, Paddington, which was the... Yeah, I think it's 62. 62. Yeah, I reckoned it was 62. Yeah. Because Pam Ringwood's in this picture. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, um, She's over on the right. And you've got, you've got um, some other notable people there. There's your uncle. So, so what I, I was wondering, what, how, Graham, how we might sort of have a look at this photographs and what, what you'd like to do with, with this. I mean, we can identify different people. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, Effie Baker's there. How, how did you, Graham, what do you think? You're, you're muted, can't hear you. John, I'm not really sure. I... Um, I thought that if we have a session where we look at some of the old photographs, it might uh, spark some ideas about how we can um, encourage people to share the photographs either online like this or get them into the archive, but more importantly, find a way that we can work together to identify everybody in the photos. Uh, now, I don't think we can do that online right now, but I think we do need to find a way to um, you know, for those friends who are still alive and kicking and, and know who these faces are, because the younger generation have no idea and uh, it'll be, it becomes harder and harder as the years go by. As I say, we don't need to sort it all out now, but we raise the topic of how do we, how do we work together to ensure that uh, photos get identified. But John, what I think we can do uh, in this session, there's half an hour left, is uh, for you and your friends who you've encouraged to come online to share some anecdotes and stories, just as you did when you told us the amazing story of how you went to your first summer school 
Mm. Memory was prompted by that photo, even though it wasn't the exact summer school. But I think if you have uh, some memories to share of some of these early uh, believers, uh, or if any of your other friends who you, you wanted to make sure were online tonight uh, want to share some as well, we've got about a half an hour left to work with. So I leave it to you to share what you'd like to share with us. Well, uh, there are quite a few people in this photograph that I... That I um, if we sort of look at the back of the photograph, we've got, like, standing on my right is Peter Kahn. Yes. Okay, and then next to him is John Stevenson. Yep. Next to him is Ian Walker, who was my yep. And moving across there to the left, uh, you can see um, that looks like Laurie Lake. To me. Yep. Uh, and then there's Howard Harwood. Yep. And then there's Orb Lake. Yep. Uh, and there's Greta Lake. Yep. And there's on the... Fred the Grant. This is Fred Grant. Yep. Okay, and next... He, he was the first Jewish believer. Yes. He, this is a fascinating story. Uh, uh, perhaps a Bruce... Uh, Bruce, are you there? Oh, I have. Bruce Saunders there? Yeah, we're both here. Yeah, Vicky and I are here. Very interested, John. Good to catch up with you. Yeah, okay. Well, um, the picture, James. What should we leave Bruce for the moment? Uh, we leave um, um, Fred Grant for the moment until we come to the Yerendor picture, and we can talk about that because his wife is in that picture as well, and maybe her mother. Yeah. Um, then there's Jeff Rodwell. Peter Lake is the sort of fairly tall woman. Uh, next to Fred Grant. Uh, my mute cut down. I said I might not. What's that? And uh, moving across, there's um, in the middle of the photograph is Effie Baker. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, now, some of those ladies, I cannot remember their names, that group of ladies. Um, Mrs. Harris is there. Harris. That's the lady just two down from Jeff Rodwell. Another lady just uh, below that who's got a lovely smile. Um, I think that's Pat Pennington, isn't it? Um, Diana Stevens? Is it Ira Shimke? That's uh, it. Is that Ira Shimke? Yes. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And Mariette Bolton is there just behind, behind um, Effie. Effie Baker. Yeah. It looks like. It's yeah. Mariette Bolton there, yes. Oh, Mariette has the hat on. Yes. Um, I met Mariette uh, several times, and I remember I met her once in Orange. Uh, she, they had a beautiful house up there. Uh, you, that must have been when you were there as well, David. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And uh, she was a very dynamic woman, Mariette Bolton. Mm -hmm. um, and then next to me is Bruce Saunders. Thank you. And in front of Bruce Saunders <laughs> is Babs Roper. Babs Roper. <laughs> Correct. And next to her is uh, Madge Featherston. Um, mm. And behind Madge is Hugh Walker, who is with us tonight, and then Collis Featherston. And next yep. to Hugh is, uh, what's her name again here? Elaine Franz. Elaine Franz, that's right. And then the lady with the grey hair. Um, Thelma Perks. Thelma That's Perks. Right. And yeah. behind Thelma is Frank Langley. Frank Langley. And then the person next to Thelma is um, uh, Hugh. You know who that is? Walter Hancock. Walter Hancock. That's right. Next to Walter Hancock. Next to Walter Hancock is Noel Blewett. That's right. Blewett is Frank Kahn. Mm -hmm. Yep. And below Frank Kahn is Bessie Walker. Mm -hmm. Next to Bessie is Percy Armand and Maisie Armand. Yeah. No, that's not Maisie. Is that not Maisie? No. Okay. Who is that? Is, is, is it, uh, I don't know what uh, Babs looked like. Is that the uh, his? No, Babs is in the middle next to Madge. Okay, right. So unidentified, but team, you're going well. This is spectacular. Keep going. And uh, 
coming further down, um, uh, below um, former Perks is uh, oh, this guy. He was the caretaker of Yarrow. Yeah. Albert Styles. That's right. Yeah. Oh, I, I was right. I, I picked that one. And um, uh, next to the woman next to Albert Styles. Pauline was, Mason. Pauline Mason. That's it. Pauline Mason is um, uh, Margaret Blewett's mother. That's right. That's right. Is Margaret Blewett in here anywhere? And uh, and then the, below. Um, Below her is Pam Ringwood. Pam That's Ringwood right. was on the National Spiritual Assembly for a number of years. In and in New Zealand. She <laughs> served on the NSI of Australia as well. Yep. And uh, and then the person next to Pam Ringwood, uh, the man, who is that on, uh, on the right? I don't know. Ring, ring in, nobody knows. No. No, I don't know. And who's the person in the black suit. That's Paul Slaughter. Paul Slaughter. That's oh, it. Paul. Right. Yeah, that's right. And who is this sitting next, sitting next to Paul Slaughter? Don't know. Can't but, help you. Uh, my Uncle Noel. Yep. And uh, then the lady in the floral dress, well, just next below that, who is that? Oh, I know. And then here is... Um, I may be wrong, but it looks like Marjorie Duncan. Yes, I think you're right. Could be. Could be right, yeah. Uh, now, next to them, the, two, the guy with the tie in the front, his name is Rolf Peters. And uh, Rolf Peters. Uh, is sitting next to him. I can't remember her first name. I forgot Gwendy. Her. Gwendy. Wendy with a G. Yeah, Gwendy Peters. Rolf and Gwendy Peters. They were they were both chiropractors. Next to next to him is uh, Joy Stevenson. Yep. Uh, and next mm -hmm. to him, uh, uh, Manira Sohaley and Sharpal Sohaley. Yep. Okay. Now they they are related to Fari. Um, <coughs> Manira Sohaley is a Yaganagi. Um, yes, the Yaganagi. And also her brother married Fari's sister. Um, and then next to Sharpal Sahali is, of course, David Podger with Sheeran. Yes. Little Sheeran, little Sheeran. Yeah. Sheeran is now in the Holy Land with her husband, uh, Keith Subri. That's right. She yeah. just turned 60. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this lady behind you, uh, David? Sorry? Lady on your left, above oh. you. Oh, right over on the side. I can't, I can't place her. I know that's Fred Grant behind her. Yes. Is, that, is that someone from Sutherland? It probably. I think. Anyway. I'm just, I'm just trying to think of the name. Never mind. Verna, while you're speaking there. Uh, uh, so we, we don't need to talk. What is it, Graham? Uh, do you see Mari Dunning there? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, can you, because John didn't mention Mari Dunning or Grace. Right, right there, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Between Mar uh, Mariet Bolton and whoever's peeking out the side. That's Mari Dunning. She and I did a teaching trip together. Just a hundred, behind every baker. A hundred years ago. <laughs> she was my first uh, children's class teacher. Really, an amazing person. We had such fun. We always had to stop at noon for, for the midday prayer. And she used to get very nervous when she was driving. So she had these rolls and rolls of toilet paper in the glove box. And she'd have to keep blowing a nose. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> Sorry about that. Not very dignified, but she was funny. <laughs> in these days with technology, it would be nice to have the names on the photo in a digital format. That would be great. What was that, Kev? Uh, Grace Byrne, Mum. Where's Grace Byrne? Grace Byrne is right there. Next, uh, on, on one side of Effie. Because we were... Um, 
To the right or left, Mum? F is right, our left. With the lady with the hat on and the pearls? Yes. Ah. Mm. And and with Mr Hancock up the back, um, they were part of our Sydney Baha'i community when I became a Baha'i and moved to Sydney, along with Elaine Franz and whoever else. Can't remember. Yeah. I, had a, I had very fond recollections of uh, Orb and Rita Lake and Phil and Laurie. Like, um, oh, they were fantastic. When I, when I was mm. at, that, at that age, I really didn't have anybody to go and... Mm -hmm. And so I used to go to the lakes quite a bit, and I'd just turn up, and yep. uh, that sort of set me at any time of the night or day in Sutherland. Yes. They looked after all us young ones. Greta often used to pick me up from when I finished work and take me to her house for my days off. And we had a had a great time. Mm. And, uh, one year, I like second start, John. Decided to have a youth camp at Yerrimbor, and there were three of us, Phil and Laurie Lake and myself. <laughs> was Sorry, camp. was that Anne Stark who spoke? I, I, won't, I didn't yes, catch it. Yes, Graham. I just wanted to say that the lady um, next to Mrs Harris and standing really next to Viva Rodwell is Jeannie Millway from Brisbane. Oh, yes. Jeannie. Uh, Millway, yeah. So you've got where? Where is Viva? Viva Rodwell. Next to Jeff. Ah, okay. Viva, and then the lady standing next to Viva, not behind her, but next to is. Uh, yeah, that's Jean Millway. Uh, what was her first name? Millway. Jean. 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 Mm-hmm. John. Millway. John, can I just put in a lovely fact about lovely Diva Rodwell? Um, I did some research about the first children's class in a state school, and as far as I can tell, she was the first one in, I think it was 68 in Queensland, to run a Baha'i children's class in a state school situation. Mm. The best. So, um, became the sort of um, foster mother of uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Anderson and, and she's adopted, with, uh, with them adopted. Well. yeah. We're going to, and Elizabeth is with us tonight and we're going to come to her in a moment. So let's move mm -hmm. on. Uh, okay. and we're going to have a look at this summer school picture. And this mm -hmm. is a great picture. Uh, mm -hmm. It was in about 1967. And um, uh, this is, this is got that's, that's earlier, that's earlier. Yeah, okay, so this is 62 and that must be 63, the previous one. Um, because my father is in this picture and he's standing next to Frank Kahn. Yes. He had gone to the Solomon Islands in 63. Yes. Uh, so he, this must be 62. And uh, this is now sitting here in this picture here, we have Fred and Eva Grant. You can. Uh, in the, bottom, in the front row, you can see, can you see Fred Grant with Johnny on his lap, and Eva is to his left. And, uh, and I, yes, that's right. And I suspect that the lady behind Fred may be Eva's mother, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes, it is. It's Keithy here, it is. Yes. yes. And now uh, they, they were, uh, the story of the Grants is really, Sort of a, an amazing story. Um, mm. Have we had that story before on this series? I can't remember. There's Bruce. Yeah. Bruce. Yeah. yeah. It was uh, my dad who brought him into the faith. Yeah. Mr. Blum brought yeah. uh, uh, <coughs> Fred Grant and Eva into the faith. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah. Eva is on the call with us. Eva's. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. Freddie heard about the Baha'i faith on a ship. He was on his way to Haifa, not as a Baha'i. He went to visit his sister Judy, who lived there with the family. He went to see his sister, whom he hasn't seen for six years, I don't know, years. And 
there was a lady Fred bumped into, or they were waiting in the in front of the dining room. You know, you had to line up to the dining room. And Fred noticed this lady. She was a Persian woman. Her name was Shamsi Sedagat. She was on the way to Haifa, and he, he got to talk to her. He, Fred noticed that she had a yellow pamphlet talking at the dining table another time. He kept noticing her, and she was talking about some very important. It looked to Fred like this is very important. And then he met her lining up to the dining room. And Fred asked her in conversation, she said, she told Fred about the Ten, Comma uh, Ten Commandments, <laughs> the Ten prim Principles. <laughs> Was that the Freudian sleep? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Must have been. Okay. And, uh, and when it came to the international language, Fred said, I know that. Who put this together? <laughs> because Fred saw, because of the language, straight after the war, if you spoke German in Prague, you got your hair shaved off. There was a big problem about different languages. Is after the war, you couldn't speak German. And half the people, everybody spoke German, but you got into trouble. And what else? Anyway, Fred knew this is, he understood it more than many people, that this is a big problem. So anyway, she, this woman, Shamsi, went to pioneer in Cyprus to get married to an Englishman. And okay, then she wrote down on a piece of paper, Dr. Hakim. She told him to go and see Dr. Hakim because he was going to Haifa. Fred met him and Fred also saw the guardian with a group of Baha'is, they were walking in the gardens, mm. a group of people with the guardian. Mm. And Fred thought, I want to be with them. How come I can't join them? <laughs> this was part of the story. He was, something <laughs> happened to Freddy. And he looked for a way to climb in. He said he tore his jacket. He climbed on the walls. You know, that's not funny to do that in, around the shrine. He, somebody told him he thinks it was a gardener. So he told him to go away. You know, get off there. So Fred went down the mountain, down Mount Carmel, and he met an Indian family. He entered the Indian, whatever. They were eating yellow food. You get it? They were having curry. He'd never seen yellow food like that before. And anyhow, he was trying to ask how to get in there. Finally, he came back another day and he went in, gave the paper to the slip of paper he always had in his pocket, in his wallet. Dr. Hakim, and he, he said it was Shamsi Sedaga who told him, and, and, and Dr. Hakim said, my father has the key. This is for the Shran of the Bab. My father has the key. When he comes back, I will, I will open it for you. And that's what happened. He went in the shrine. Mm. He said, I've never seen anybody more spiritual than when he waited for Dr. Hakim there. He was sitting, just sitting there like he was, I think that did it. But he, when Fred came back to Sydney, eventually after six months, one day he had this urge to go, looked up the address in the phone book, and it was Two Lang Road, and he straight away went to Two Lang Road. It was an urge. And 
And um, it was Mother Dan who opened the door for him. And Fred said, is this, anyway, that's how he got there. And he went for a year. I'll just finish here. Uh, he went to every fireside. So he remembered the, the, in the arcade in the city. Piccadilly. But Piccadilly Arcade, he kept going <laughs> there. You might remember, David. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. You remember? And uh, he knew that he, oh, wait a minute. Um, he went every time, every week, they had this fireside Sunday afternoons he was talking about. Sunday afternoon. And one day he noticed that he was the only one smoking because the, the room was full of this smoke. Nobody else was smoking. And he gave up smoking that moment. Right. Yeah. And a year later, something like that, it was Greta Lake who asked him, Fred, when are you going to start uh, carrying the cross with us? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten that one. When are you going to start carrying the cross with us? He said, now, right now. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> that was wonderful, Eva. Um, yeah. Can I, tell you, can I tell you a little story about Eva? Because um, uh, when I first met President Eva, Eva, Eva was not a Baha'i. And um, uh, Fred, John, Fred had a you, workshop. Me, John, can you come closer to your microphone, please, to tell us the story? Thank you. Uh, but, Bruce and I were in Randwick and, and they lived at 181 Carrington Road in Randwick. And uh, Fred had a little workshop at the bottom of the house and, the, and they had a flat just up the top. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Johnny had been born and they discovered that, that, that he was uh, deaf. And um, anyway, um, it was quite a, a sort of a, a struggle for him. And um, uh, Fred, uh, Fred encouraged Bruce and myself, because we were young and Eva was young, to sort of, um, uh, sort of talk to Eva about the faith. And, um, so anyway, we, I used to go there quite a bit myself, and, uh, and uh, in, the, in the kitchen upstairs, where Johnny banging the, the, the uh, horse and lids together, um, we'd talk about the Baha'i faith. And uh, anyway, one day Eva said to me, look, there's a discussion that's going to take place in some Jewish, a, 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 youth, a, a youth group is going to have a discussion. And the discussion theme will be, what is a Jew? Uh, Eva, can you remember this? You're mute. Yes. Yes. Anyway, we... we Eva took me along to this meeting to discuss the topic, <clears throat> what is a Jew? And I remember it really clearly. Uh, they were discussing whether or not a Jew is a person who is born into the Jewish faith. And if so, well, you know, what sort of, does their mother have to be a Jew? Can their father be a Jew? Uh, then the other question was, could, could a Jew be, be uh, is, is a Jew a person of a particular religion or is it the type of racial thing? Um, could you convert to become a Jew? And all of this discussion was going on in this group. And uh, anyway, this was just a perfect opportunity to present uh, the Baha'i teachings about the oneness of humanity and, uh, and so forth. And I can't remember exactly what was said, but it was a very, very emotional evening. Uh, I recall it very clearly. And, uh, and uh, and I think Eva was quite affected by this uh, discussion that took place and the, uh, and the way in which uh, the faith was introduced. Mm. John, thank you for that. Uh, time check. We're at nine o'clock. Uh, we generally finish soon, but I wanted to check if there were other stories you wanted to share with us tonight uh, before we bring the session to a close. 
Well, there's, I mean, the problem they've got here is that there's probably hundreds of stories that are, yeah. uh, <laughs> you can tell. And, uh, uh, and I'm sure that Bruce and, uh, uh, and David Podger particularly, who was sort of, had become of a higher, a number of years before I had, and uh, he would have lots of memories of, of these people. And, yes, indeed. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, we've run out of time. Mm. Can I ask one question, John? The person between Effie Baker and Fred Grant, who is that? Uh, the, uh, look, I can't. Don Wilkinson. I don't know. Oh, this <laughs> one. No, no, no. Uh, I wondered if, if that was uh, some of the guys from uh, West, South Australia. No, Fiji. He was married to Irene Williams. No, that's, that's not Victor Williams either. <laughs> oh, okay. My no, guess is Peter Keltoli from uh, Vanuatu. Vanuatu. That's my guess, but I've always thought that was Peter Keltoli, but it's not Victor Williams. But this is the fun of doing this, to get it right for the future. Mm. Yeah. We'll... Somebody asked about the Persian gentleman. Of course, we didn't have very many Persians in Australia in those days. Um, but there is one Persian man in this photograph on the far right hand side. That is uh, Manuchir um, Gabriel. That's Gabriel. right. Manuchir Gabriel. His wife um, is probably there somewhere, but I had a bit of difficulty identifying her. I wonder if, if it was the lady next to Eva. No. 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 She, Judy, that's my little cousin, Judy. <laughs> John, I couldn't. A few Victorians online with us, so maybe they can see Mrs. Gabriel in the photo. I don't think she's in Graham because she and neither of the children, because the, when they when they uh, were brought to Australia, when the um, Hand, when the Hanley family uh, uh, facilitated them to coming as the first Persian uh, into Australia. The, the children were with them, and um, the, neither the children or the mother, uh, or Malihe, are in that picture. Oh, right, okay. Anyway, Manachir is there in the, in the far right hand, in the far right hand side. There's, uh, um, there's John, right if I may add, this is Sohaila speaking. Okay. Um, this is the time when Mr. Gabriel had uh, been given temporary permission to come to Australia. Um, and his family were staying or pioneering in Indonesia. And at the time, the, the Australian government wouldn't issue them a visa, but then he had to prove that his, his race was not from Southeast Asia and he was entitled to come. I don't know the details, but it was during that time that he came to, for a visit to Australia and his family were still in Indonesia. Thank you so much. Yeah. I want to point out yes, yes. the members of the first LSA of Randwick. Many of them often pop up, and I want to introduce them to you. This is May Beat. Yeah. Many people don't know anymore. No, so. Before she, she died in Waverley, she's buried in Waverley Cemetery. The other person from her first LSA of Randwick is Don Wilkinson. <laughs> he lived in Maroubra at the time. That's right. And he moved to Canberra and stayed there. But we passed his house in Maroubra and spoke to his family. And Don still doesn't drive a car, so they have to go to Canberra to pick him up if he wants to see the house. He still has this house here in Maroubra in Garden Street. Okay, so there's another, this is Freddie and John, myself. I'm talking about the first LSA. David Poja was here later. There's Bruce. Saunders from the first LSA. Um, uh, don't forget May, okay? <laughs> it was one, two, three, King Street, Randwick. <laughs> I know all your 
her dresses. <laughs> so, and then Sue was on the first LSD, Sue Podja. Yep. And it is a remarkable coincidence here, remarkable life. Here is Meg de Gattardi. Yes. Oh, oh, Meg, yeah, David's wife. Mm -hmm. And she was a lawyer, and we, she helped David to help establish the LSA of, or form the group. And they came to the firesides like every week. I don't know if it's Friday, Saturday night, probably, at May Beat's house. Right, David? I think so. I yes, you it. did, with Mag. And I asked stupid questions. So there <laughs> is Shireen. <laughs> I just want to point another one out. This is not the first LSA of Randwick. This is Claudia Kelly from Melbourne. And her grandmother, she told me herself, her grandmother in England asked Dr. Eselmond, Eselmond to yes. write the Eselmond book, Pauline de New Era. It was her grandmother who paid for this first edition. The introduction to the Baha to Baha'u'llah and the New Era, the first edition mentions her name and that she asked, I'm um, not sure, but she, it was her grandmother who asked <laughs> the book to be written. She spoke to Esmond. okay? Yeah. I'm just looking for another LSA Randwick first LSA. Who did I leave out? This John, John was a youth, as he said, and he was a youth. Yeah, okay. John. No, really. no, he was not the first LSA. Okay, no. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good the evening. Um, if you could mute everybody, thanks. Thank you. And I'll just conclude. Look, it's been um, uh, wonderful to have this. Uh, all these uh, reminiscences, and reminiscences tonight, uh, and, um, and also the opportunity to share with you my own personal story. But we, we sort of cut the story short a little bit because we were going to go to, this is the first National Spiritual Assembly I, that I served on in 1967. And here we have um, John Davidson, uh, from the left, John Davidson, Tim Heavy, Stanley Bolton Jr., Rita Lake, uh, Elizabeth Heinsohn, uh, John Walker, um, Jeff Rodwell, Roy Stevenson, and Peter DeVogel. Uh, and uh, I was really surprised when I got elected to the National Spiritual Assembly, I tell you. Um, I, I recall that I was so excited uh, that, um, that, that, that I thought I was going to change the world in a year. <laughs> One day, Jeff Rodwell took me aside. He was the chairman. He said, look, John, he said, calm down. Um, he said, uh, look, uh, you know, you, 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 won't, you won't get anywhere if, you, if you're too enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe John Davidson remembers that. <laughs> what was that punchline? He said, uh, he said to me, you won't get anywhere if you're too enthusiastic. <laughs> And you've changed, have you? And this was, this was the uh, Intercontinental Conference in 1967, uh, where I met Fari. Uh, and uh, we can't, we don't have time to go through any of this. And uh, anyway, there are too many faces. Yeah. Uh, and that resulted in us. Uh, uh, getting married, we got we we met on Thursday, decided to get married on Sunday, Saturday, had an engagement party uh, with the hands of the paws on Sunday, and got married two months later. Good, oh, good on you, Johnny. Fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, we had hand of the cause, Hugo G. Carey and Thomas Featherston at the yeah. engagement party. Mm -hmm. Okay, friends, well, that's it. Uh, I'm sure we could have, could have discussed so many other things. I, 
I can see Bruce and Casey there. So many memories uh, related to them. David and Sue, David Podger, I met him soon after. I mean, he left Australia in the early 60s and went to live in Papua New Guinea. Um, I remember visiting Papua New Guinea and uh, meeting up with him in Ley. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I, I had fond memories of Sue uh, before she married David as well. <laughs> in, in Randwick. Right. It took a long time to get to the Solomons, John. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, it, friend. Okay, can I say something? Yeah. Harry, there you are. Uh, okay, everyone. <laughs> I tell you now that I have got the virus, and it is the virus of love. Spread <laughs> a <laughs> lot and say good night. The virus of love. Pass it on to everyone, please. <laughs> what you say? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, Fari, and thank you, John. Yeah. Um, I looked up the Australian Baha'i Bulletin, and it reports your father's declaration is reported in the January 1946 edition. Oh, 1946. Your father's first name was Edward? Edward Hamlin. And he was registered from the Community. So e Edward H. Uh, Walker is registered in the Baha'i Quarterly in January 1946 on page eight. So we've solved that little problem tonight. John, I want to thank you very much for tonight. Uh, we all agree that we could, there is much more to do uh, in, in reminiscing through these photos. You have made a wonderful start tonight. Uh, thank you all for being part of tonight. It got a bit raucous at the end, but I think that's what these sessions require. I thank so much the reminiscences that have been added there by David and Sue, by Bruce and Keithy, uh, by Eva Grant as well. And uh, thank you for your comments in the side. I will send those comments to everybody who's getting an email from me so that, because there are some details there, there's some website links, uh, and there's been a suggestion that maybe we set up a Facebook page so that we can put these photos on the Facebook page and then people at their leisure can add in any uh, identification of, of people and that will serve that purpose. Next week, we will come online again at 7.30. David Podger will give some recollections of meeting Clara Dunn in Sydney when he was uh, just a young man and a, a fairly new Baha'i. And on the same evening, we will have uh, a community history from Coringai. So thank you so much for tonight. And we look forward to having you online next week. There's a number of people on the session tonight that uh, most likely will be giving their presentations in the coming months. Uh, you know, we're going to start moving into looking at the Baha'i community in each state, starting with New South Wales next week. We'll travel around the country for the next two months. And after that, we'll continue with stories from individual friends as well. So thank you so much for tonight. Um, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you. No, no, no. Excuse me. Excuse me.